In 916 AD, a woman drew her sword against her enemies and led her kingdom into battle. She would lose that fight and her life that same day. She was taken away to be buried with honors as the empress she was, but her empire would not long survive her absence, and soon both grave and civilization were lost to time. Life soon grew to legend, and the question of this woman's existence grew larger and larger as the years passed. Now she is both, empress and enigma. But before all that, she was Sochi. Before we really get started, I do want to apologize in advance. I did quite a bit of research into how to pronounce certain names and have tried to follow Nalwan and Mesoamerican pronunciation guides as closely as I could find them. But I found opinions and examples that differed, sometimes pretty wildly, from source to source. I've tried my best, but I'm afraid that some names might come out pretty mangled. Thank you for your understanding. Now, let's talk about the last empress. Truthfully, the question of Sochi's existence beyond myth is a representation of the Toltec culture as a whole, and I could do an entire episode just about them. The Toltecs were a culture that reigned over the region in and around present-day Tula Hidalgo, Mexico, from around 674 to 1122 AD. They are defined as both a classic and post-classic civilization of Mesoamerican chronology, which saw the rise of the powerful, independent city-states like the Maya and Aztecs we know of today all over the region of Central America and Mexico. Toltec history and traditions are mostly oral, passed along after their decline and collapse, with some pictographic evidence left behind by the Aztecs as well. To researchers and archaeologists of the era, this has led to much doubt and criticism of what has been told. They argue that the history of the Toltec Empire, including Sochi, is largely mythological, made up by the Aztecs as a sort of aspirational goal for their own empire. That the admiration and nostalgia the Aztecs held for their predecessor culture has led to the obfuscation of the actual Toltecs, and should be discarded. One of the earliest mentions of Toltecs comes from a Dominican friar named Diego Duran, who was studying the history of Mesoamerica. He tells the story he was told of a wise man who spoke and performed miracles to an astonished audience, who called the man and his followers Toltecs. Duran was told this meant master, or wise men. The miracle worker was apparently none other than Topiltzin, last king of the Toltecs. Did this event ever happen? One can't be sure. Duran, through his research, thought that Topiltzin was actually Thomas the Apostle, come to spread the gospel to the natives, even though any evidence he had for this connection was circumstantial at best. He called them Toltecs, but even Duran didn't truly believe that these men were who they said they were. Toltec, you see, was merely a descriptor. Skeptics of the concept of the Toltec Empire as its own powerful being will point out that Tolteca, to the native Nahuan people of the region, merely means artist or wise man. Any large city could have been conceivably ruled by Toltecs, and might have been called Tolan, like the Toltec capital had been supposedly named, if it had a population mostly made of craftsmen. But now that I've laid out some of the modern-day doubts, let's go back and give their history its due weight as well. According to oral tradition, the Toltec Empire began in the city of Tlachikatsin, ruled by the Huehue Tlapalan, who called the residents of that city Tolteca in honor of their great artistic ability. In 583, the Tolteca grew frustrated with their rulers and rebelled. For 13 years, they held up in the city against their overlords, but in the end, they were forced to flee. The Toltecs traveled the region, establishing cities here and there, and nearly 100 years after their rebellion in 674, they found a pre-existing community called Memhemi that they took over and renamed Tolan, or Tula. Tolan never grew to be as big as some later Mesoamerican cities, but at the time, it might have been one of the largest cities in the region. The Toltecs began branching out to create new cities and polities to form their empire, eventually growing to control much of central Mexico. They would also reach down into the Yucatan Peninsula, where they would intermingle with the Maya, and perhaps even far upwards as well, trading with the Mississippian tribes in the north. They would become a diverse culture made primarily of farmers, merchants, and craftsmen, with other castes made up of priests and soldiers. The Toltecs appeared to have worshipped many gods that would later be adopted into the Aztec pantheon like Tezcatlipoca and Tlaloc, and possibly practiced human sacrifice as well. To some Aztecs, this was a utopia, the ideal society that they must emulate and carry on in spirit, 
According to them, the Toltecs would end with the reign of God King Sayakata Tolpilzin Quetzalcoatl, last lord of the Toltecs, in 947 AD. He left Tula by choice or force, depending on the retelling, taking with him all the city's majesty and power and transforming it into a regular spot on the map that would soon fade to history. In reality, the Toltec collapse might have occurred because its increasingly militarized culture, already fractured by ethno-religious struggles between its two prominent tribes, the Nonoalca and the Chichimeca, was not able to react well to a drought that swept through Mexico in the 1100s, one that had already cut the Maya off at the knees. There was a subsequent massive migration from Toltec lands downwards to lower parts of Mexico and into Central America, and, sensing weakness, northern tribes attacked what was left of Tolan and the Toltecs. They were eventually defeated and collapsed for good in 1116 AD. Some historians would argue that no, it's much simpler than all that. Tolan and the Toltecs were never that impressive in the first place, and their civilization did not so much collapse as the Aztecs did rise. But the Aztecs themselves have a different story. In theirs, Topiltzin traveled the land to find its resting place, leaving behind an almost cult-like figure in his wake for the Aztecs, who would then use their close ties to Topiltzin to lay claim to his land in Central America, which they were conveniently holding for him until his mythical return. The idolization of Topiltzin and the Toltecs in general might have contributed a great deal to the eventual defeat of the Aztecs by the Spaniards, as some saw Hernan Cortes as the god king reborn. But what about the rulers that came before Sayacatl Topiltzin Quetzalcoatl? None can measure up to a messianic mage god made flesh, but there were a few, according to some, who came close. One of these was the warrior queen and Topiltzin's predecessor, Sochi. Her story comes from a man named Fernando de Alva Cortez Ichtli Sochi, an Aztec Spaniard nobleman directly descended from Acohua kings who chronicled Aztec history. Of particular note is his early 1600s work, Relacion Historica de la Nación Tolteca, or Relacion, where he relayed much of his people's stories of the Toltec Empire, including their great empress. Fernando tells the story of the ninth Toltec king, a man named Tecpancalzin Iztacalzin, who ascended to the throne around 833 AD. He had married a woman named Maxio before or soon after his crowning, and they had several daughters together. That did nothing to hold him back when, ten years into his reign, he discovered Sochi. Well, discovered is not quite the right word. Sochi's date of birth is unknown, and her birthplace can only be defined as somewhere in the Toltec Empire. But we know of her father, Papansen. Papansen was a nobleman and cultivator of plants, and in 843, he invented a new type of sugar that came from the agave plant. From this, he created the drink pulque, an alcoholic beverage made of fermented agave sap. Beyond delighted and eager for recognition, Papansen traveled to Tolan to show his great creation to the empire. I imagine Tecpancalzin was quite pleased with the gift, but what really enraptured him was the beautiful young woman who poured him his cup of pulque, Sochi. It was love at first sight for Tecpancalzin and he demanded Xochitl stay with him in the capital to become his mistress. Xochitl was not thrilled with her new living arrangements, and even less so with her captor, and begged her father to free her. Papansen might have tried, but he was quickly dissuaded by Tecpancalzin. Leave her with me, the emperor said, and I'll make her empress after me. Even if I should die, she'll rule the Toltecs. Imagine, making a queen with one swig of a drink. With this promise, Papansen was satisfied and the deal was done. Xochitl was left locked away in the palace of Tolan. Her input on her future was not required. She was soon pregnant and had a son she named Topiltzin Mekanetsin. Xochitl must have figured, hey, duty done, got your son, leave me be, and she tried to leave the palace after Mekanetsin's birth in 846. But Tekpenkaltzin dangled the same carrot in front of her that he had her father. Stay with me, the emperor said, and I'll name our son the heir. Even if we should both die, he'll rule the Toltecs. Again, deal done. So Cheat stayed and would stay for the next 30 to 40 years of Tecpancalzin's reign. In that time, Queen Maxio would die, and Sochi became the official queen of the Toltec Empire. I can't help but wonder if Sochi remembered her father upon her crowning, if she even still spoke to him after he'd given her up, or had time, environment, and her own child made her sympathetic to what he had done. Unfortunately, the human element is quite lost in these kinds of histories, 
only the legendary remains. Sometime between 877 to 885, Tetpen Kaltsen was deposed. Sochi had been his queen for nigh on 20 years at this point, but she did not retreat from the throne quietly with her husband. Instead, she took what had been promised all those years ago, the throne, the crown, and the entire Toltec Empire. She was Empress Sochi. Sochi is now known for being a warrior queen of a sorts. She ruled alone over Tolan and the Empire from her ascension in 877. She oversaw the start of an explosion of growth both in urban development as the city moved from their original center in Tula Chico to a new district of Tula Grande, and population as well. Tula became a mecca for migrants and travelers, their already diverse population enriched even further. With progress, however, came instability, and around 916, civil war would erupt among the Toltecs, due to religious or ethnic suppression or some combination of both, and an army would march on her throne. Sochi was elderly now, but the fire in her had not dimmed. She called on other women to join her, and together they formed an all-female battalion to join the soldiers on the battlefield outside of the city of Toltalan. The empress, of course, led the way. She would fight and die on that battlefield, along with her deposed husband, Tekpen Kaltsen. Her son, Topiltsen Mekanetsen, would ascend to the throne in her place. Some say he was the god-king, say a coddle Topiltsen Quetzalcoatl himself. He, too, would fall victim to the Civil War, although he would escape Tolan and the Toltec Empire with his life. With his absence and that of his followers, it would collapse, and the grave of Sochi, last empress of the Tolteca, would be lost forever. Now, was any of that real? I honestly can't tell you. Fernando's works are the only ones that acknowledge Sochi as a real person, and many sources omit her and her son Mekanetsen from the line of Toltec succession entirely. Adding to the confusion is the fact that the Toltec calendar is not completely understood even now, and in fact shows evidence of being of the same cyclical nature as the Aztec and Maya calendars, which means we could be missing entire decades of rulers, or we could be separating those who were actually all one person with different titles. For example, many of the events I just told you about I noted as happening in the late 800s to early 900s, while many other historians mark these same events as happening over 100 years later. There are also undeniable fairy tale elements to Sochi's story. The humble beauty made queen, the princess locked in the tower, the warrior queen leading her people into battle. She's incredibly impressive as a figure, and just like the idea of the Toltecs as an advanced utopia was more important than the actual Toltec culture to the Aztecs, to the point where it might have superseded reality itself, the legend of Sochi is far more glamorous and long-lasting than whatever woman might have really existed. But, like the Toltec culture, let's give her the chance few do nowadays. Let's say she was completely real. A simple girl brought to her king, sold to a man she did not love who would not let her be free. Trapped by ambition or motherhood or circumstance, she stayed. She waited. Patient flower who would now only accept freedom when it was absolute watching as her husband and captor was tossed aside and seizing her chance for power, becoming empress of her people, ruling for 10 years, 20, 30, all on her own, and then witnessing her country crumbling into pieces under her rule, not waiting for her enemies to come for her this time, but going to meet them instead, fighting, falling on the battlefield beside the women she brought together and trained, finished and then forgotten for such a long time, until one man decided to write down all the stories he'd been told all his life. And then, living again. Maybe the real God King was her all along. If you believe this is merely myth, then I hope you'll forgive this indulgence of an episode. If you believe there's truth here, then I hope you'll try to follow the thread I've started even further. Whatever you believe, I hope I've given you something new to think on, and I hope you remember her. Her name and her culture. Sochi last empress of the Toltecs.